Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Angela Merkins, and I am one of the teammates here at the Rec Innovation Lab. Tonight, we have an amazing speaker. She's one of our uh, mentors here at the Rec Innovation Lab. And I'm actually going to hand it over to Maisha to, to introduce herself. But we are so excited to, and glad to have you here. Thank you so much, Maisha. Yeah, thanks, Angela. Thanks for inviting me. I, I actually love working with the Rec. So, um, and there's always so many topics that I want to bring up, but I think this one will be a fun one tonight. So my name is Maisha Cobb, and um, I have a startup called Impact International. We focus specifically on developing inclusive work environments and building a space where people can be free to share their thoughts, their opinion, and all the different realms of diversity that they bring. Um, tonight, I'm here representing New Fund Ventures. I'm an angel investor with New Fund, and um, I joined the board last year. We are a wonderful organization of about 300 members who are based here in San Diego, um, and we do lots of angel investing. So pleased to be here. And in my spare time, as Angela mentioned, I love to mentor startups, including some of the um, organizations from the Rec Innovation Lab. So pleased to be here. Awesome. Thank you, Maisha. You've helped with so many of our startups, especially like Chrome Cheese and several others. And we just really appreciate having you here. So um, yeah. today, if you guys have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Maisha, would you like to have our team watch the chat for you? Or and would yeah, you like and I and I, I think I think so. This doesn't just become a monologue, but what I'll probably end up doing is stopping after every couple of slides and seeing if some burning questions are out there so we can truly, even though we can't be in person together, we can make this more like a chat versus um, a lecture yeah. series. Hey, one other thing before I um, kick off, I have, I'm gonna, in partnership with Village Up, there is going to be a really cool session that we're gonna hold on August 3rd at mm -hmm. Evo Nexus. So for those of you who don't know Evo Nexus, it's a big incubator here in town that helps take startups to the next level. So once you get to that point where you've generated a bit of revenue, they would be a great partner for you. But a few of us who are founders and leaders in the community are gonna to get together and talk about a really important topic around imposter syndrome. And we felt it was really important to touch on it just because as founders, it's something that we all deal with and it doesn't go away regardless of what age and stage you're at. So we felt like it was really important to bring that topic to life. So please look for um, the invite from Village up on, or the, the announcement on LinkedIn, and we hope you can join us. So let me share my screen. I just posted the LinkedIn event in the chat. Awesome, yeah, it's gonna be in person, so we'd love to see you there. I'd love to get a chance to meet some of you. Um, so I've been an angel investing for about two, I guess this is going into my third year, and when I first started, I had no idea what was involved in it. I had no idea what I was doing, but I've learned so much over that journey, both from the side of being an investor, as well as from the side of what are we looking for from the entrepreneurs who come to us for funding. So tonight is really about, let's, let's kind of lift the veil of funding, angel investing um, in particular, and help you all develop some tools and tricks that'll help you to get some funding when you're at that stage. So to begin with, I love to just do interactive things. So there is a link at the top that you can plug into your phone or your website, your web browser, polev.com slash Maisha Cobb 153. Um, I find the text is more difficult. So I, you know, personally go for the website, but you can also text my name 153 to 22333. And the question is, what do you believe is the right stage to seek angel funding? What's the right stage to seek angel funding? And it should start popping up for us live as you all start to text in or, or plug in your answers. So let's hang on here and see what you all believe.
Oh, why is it not showing? This is the problem with these live things, isn't it? I'll have to figure out how it usually populates it right here. So maybe at the end, I'll go back into the back end and see um, what the numbers are because it usually populates it here. So keep, keep plugging away and I'll figure out the technology side as we go through things. All right. So what we're gonna talk about today, um, one, I wanna make sure that we cover all the bases around stages of funding, including angel investing or angel funding. And angel funding is just one of many ways that you can get funding. So we'll talk about the other ways as well. Um, we'll talk about what angel investors are looking for because as much as your ventures matter to you, um, there's also some things that matter to angel investors. And the more that you understand what goes into their mind, the better it's going to be for you as you think about your pitch and how you position yourself. And then to that last point, we're going to talk about some things that you can do to make your organization feel more attractive. All right, so let's get into it. What's an angel investor? Um, and um, like, what do we do? So I think about an angel investor as not just someone who is interested in putting money into startups, but who are also interested in devoting their expertise and talent into the startups. So at the very early stages of an organization, yeah, the money is going to be helpful, but there's a lot of ways that you could waste that money and be inefficient with it. And so one of the things that becomes really beneficial is having some insight from people who've been in the business world who understand the industry that you're in um, or who just have seen enough of these kind of deals that they understand some of the pitfalls and some of the things that you can avoid, as well as some of those things that are going to accelerate and help you grow even quicker. For most of us, angel investments will be the first sort of outside of friends and family money that we get in those seed rounds for our startup. And it comes with a little bit of pressure, right? Because unlike friends and family who you can say, listen, this is what I'm doing, and they may or may not want to get into the weeds, depending on what the investment is from an angel investor, they're going to want to be involved in your business. And that can range from, you know, let me just get updates on how you're doing to we demand having a seat on the board in the case of some of the lead investors who are really putting in big money into your enterprise. Interestingly, um, angel investing is, is really big, right? And I think probably even over this $25 billion over the past couple of years, I know that money has gotten a little bit tighter in recent months, given the, the financial things that are happening in the equity markets and some investors are starting to pull back but it's a significant amount of dollars that angel investors, typically who operate in groups or syndicates, um, offer up. And so let's talk about really quickly what a, what a group or syndicate is. I mentioned New Fund Ventures, um, and Ray, who's part of the, the Rec Innovation Lab, for those of you who are, are part of the group, he's probably talked to you about this a little bit too, but for others, um, it's really a group of individuals who are coming together and saying, let's pull our money in and, and invest it across different um, areas so that we can diversify the risk. So instead of an individual just being someone who says, all right, I'm going to take on this business and invest my dollars, this sort of helps you to share and spread that risk out a bit across multiple people. So in New Fund Ventures, there's about 250 of us who participate in what we call a fund every year, which is a big pot of money that we look at um, to, to spread out across 20 to 20 or so companies with the average investments being somewhere between 250K and 500K. Any questions so far? Anything else? Yeah, please. So um, uh, I, I don't remember the names of the different rounds or whatever, but 
Um, are angels generally the very first round of uh, investors? And what are the next one? I always keep forget like venture capital and then like angel investors and all that. there's so many uh, levels seemingly. Um, yeah. 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 So let's talk about that, right? So let's we'll, we'll jump ahead and then I'll go backwards. So this is your question here, and so um, and this kind of answers the question that came up in the survey that didn't pop up for us. And so you're usually going to be looking for angel investments when you have a, a, a working product, right? A, a prototype that's probably a little bit farther behind, beyond just a concept. You know that this is something that has potential. Um, oftentimes what we're looking for is a product that is actually already selling. So having some revenue behind you is going to be very, very important. So it's not that early stage where you're doing more of what we call bootstrapping, right? So the bootstrapping is, um, which, you know, by the way, is a lot of money every year, about $185 billion. People are spending their own money to invest in their enterprises every year. So that's probably the earliest stages where you're like, you know, let me test my idea. And then I think it comes to the friends and family which is, hey, I have this idea. I, you know, I've gone through my personal savings. I've maxed out my credit cards. Whatever it is that we, you know, have has made us reach the point where we're saying I can't fund this any longer on my own. That's where friends and family, or even crowd funding and accelerators, come in. So if we go back to this chart, in that pre-seed, somewhere between. I would say somewhere between fifty to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars becomes a really hard spot to raise money. Angels typically want to start a little bit higher than that, and so this is where you're going to go to friends and family or crowdsourcing, um, or even look for grants. And then when you've crossed that threshold where you're starting to need significant investment, that's where you want to start looking to angel investors. Does that answer your question, Tommy? Yep, perfectly. Thanks. Yeah, Aisha, no worries. There's a question in the chat. Um, someone wants to know if there's a minimum investment that's required to be an angel investor. Oh, that's a good question. So yes, um, there is. And so we do have um, minimums for the fund that we have at New Fund Ventures. Um, and it's, you know, it's it's not hundreds of thousands. It's, you know, tens of thousands. And um, I'm sure every angel investment group is a bit different. There are other qualifications though, right? And so let's go backwards a little bit and talk about, you know, what are some of the motivations? So it's not just how much money you put in, but it's also, can you assume the risk that's involved with angel investing? So we're typically looking for qualified investors who have minimum net worth, minimum annual income. Um, really, and it's really about protecting people from these super high risk investments. So if you think about where all of you are right now, of course we want all of your ventures to be very successful, but I think it's somewhere around what 80 to 90% of first time businesses don't succeed. So there's a, a whole lot of risk that angel investors are taking on. And so in order to do that, we wanna make sure that people are qualified to take on that risk. Any other questions before we go back? Looks like Yolanda might have a question. Okay. I do definitely have a question. So Maisha, when you say, when you look at a corporation, for investment, for an angel investor, you determine that when the product is ready to go to market, okay? So that can also be determined when a service is ready to go to market. Mm -hmm. What if the corporation already has investment from a bank? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So, yeah. And so is there a second part to that question? One more thing. Angel investors, um, do they typically similar to venture capitalists take equity investment mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah, so we're gonna get, we're, so let's go back. I'm curious about the term sheets. <laughs> so that let's go back to this 
slide and I think we'll answer some of your questions here, Yolanda, and anything I don't cover, um, keep me honest, okay? So let's talk about the, the motivation for why people angel invest. And it, it is very personal, right? I mean, I went into it initially because I felt like there was, there was not a lot of representation from people who look like me in the angel investing field. And I wanted to make sure that I was understanding how this worked and, and being able to open some doors for other diverse founders. I also wanted to um, share some of my knowledge and I also wanted to learn. And so um, there is some personal reasons why people do this. And to your question, Yolanda, a lot of it is about the extrinsic motivation, right? We talked about there's a lot of risk in here. And so we're always looking at what's going to be the rate of return for this potential investment and how do we balance out what that risk is going to be to that return happening? And so IRR, super critical. Um, most angel investments will not have an exit, right? So we're always looking for what are those organizations that look like they have the biggest potential to be a unicorn, right? A company that's going to make, make it to a billion dollar valuation. So Yolanda, to your, to your question in particular, valuation is the name of the game, right, for, for anyone. And so part of the, the interest in being an angel investor is getting in very early into an organization and being able to reap some benefits of getting into that organization early. And part of the benefit of that is getting equity in the organization. And getting that equity when it's very, very low in price so that as the company grows in valuation, your investment is going to grow as well. So that's where you start talking about, you talked about the term sheet. And so that's where you get into things like discounting, right? And so one of the terms that we talk about in angel investing, investing is discount rate. Right? And that is basically, I'm going to give you X amount of dollars today in your pre-seed or in your seed round. And then when you go into your next round of funding, I want to make sure that whatever that next valuation is, I'm going to be able to get a discount so that I can get more equity at a rate that's more favorable because I took the risk with you early on. Does that answer your question, Yolanda? Oh, absolutely. I comprehend. Okay. <laughs> I comprehend very well. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And you're, you, you had a question about debt. And so, um, so the, the thing about debt is that's going to impact your valuation. Right. And so you want to think about how much debt are you taking on and, um, you know, are you going to be able to, to, to pay that back? Because that's going to impact what you're worth ultimately. Right. Or your debt needs to balance out with cash flow. Hopefully you'll have the cash flow. So we definitely right. do look at debt cash needs flow. To yeah, debt yeah. needs to balance out with cash flow or cash flow needs to be higher than debt. So the debt to income, the cash flow ratio is higher. All of our finance friends will love you for saying that. Um, <laughs> I comprehend <laughs> very well. But, but this is why you really want to make sure that you're seeking that angel investment somewhere around the time where you actually have a product that's working and where you're already introducing it to the market. Typically when people come for angel investing, they've seen traction in the market. I'm sure you all talked about traction, which just means, you know, you've identified that there is a need for what you offer and customers are willing to pay for it. And ideally they're coming back and you're having some, some recurring revenue that's happening too. And typically people are then coming to angel investors to say, all right, I've proven the idea, it's working, I need to scale up so that I can maintain my competitive advantage. All right, other, I see there's a couple things that came up in the chat, Angela, anything that you want me to answer right now? Um, I believe those were from Yolanda. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So cool. So angel investing is somewhat angelic, but you know, a lot about, 
you know, show me the exit as well. And that's what you all should be thinking about as you're building your businesses. We didn't talk about venture capital. And I think that was one of the questions that Tommy raised. So venture capital, you really cross the chasm when you get to, to venture capital and your company is on the path to making very big revenue and venture capital investments I believe start probably in the two to $3 million range and they go up from there. And those become your partners who are gonna grow with you for the long haul. Once you, once you reach um, a level of maturity, that's where you start hearing about either going IPO or you're gonna go into the public market. SPACs were, were special purpose acquisition companies is what a SPAC is. It was sort of an easy way to do an IPO. I think there's been some pitfalls in that, so I don't know how long those will be around. But for a lot of companies, what ends up happening is you reach a stage of maturity and then you, you, you don't know how to grow anymore. And so PE firms may come in and say, we'll buy you because they see different parts of your portfolio that they're going, that they're going to be able to monetize later or they come in to help you figure out how you restructure your business so that you can get back on the path to growth. And they are usually very much about show me the money um, either through an exit that is an IPO or another acquisition or selling off some of your assets through divestiture. Um, so we talked about this a little bit right? That angel, um, angel investing really kind of feeds that gap between when you've proven that your, um, your idea works and that you haven't proven that there's scalability and revenue that can get you into those VCs yet. And so angel investors become really, really important. And most of the deals that I've been seeing, um, people are typically going to multiple angel investment groups, and they're raising somewhere between, you know, 750000 up to about $2 million to get their businesses um, in a good spot. Typically to fund, um, typically to fund like R and not R&D, sorry, marketing and sales and commercial viability, because that's where it starts to get tough um, once you've kind of proven things with those early customers. Some of it R and D too, but a lot of it is about commercial viability. So let's talk about um, how you might evaluate an angel investor because I know it's exciting to think about someone wanting to invest in your company, but you should really think about this as a two-way relationship, and you definitely don't want to join forces with the wrong angel investor because they're really going to be in your business, right? They're, they're going to want to understand the nuts and bolts. They're going to want to see your balance sheets. They're going to want to, as I said, be part of the board in some cases. And so you got to think about long-term, is this an investor that aligns with me and where my company is trying to go? I also think about that as, is it the right time for me to think about an angel investor? Because once you start bringing in outside investment, it's going to change the trajectory of your company because you're now going to have to answer to a lot more numbers versus some of the vision that a lot of us love having and owning um, in the early stages of our company. So a couple of things that I think are important for you to evaluate, and I certainly want to hear from others if there are other things that you would add in. Um, one, commitment and track record, right? So who have they funded before? And how many exits, successful exits have they had? And what did that, what did that look like? We talked about deal terms earlier. And so um, when I was in business school, we did a really fun activity where we had to simulate running a business and thinking about how much of the equity we kept versus how much of it we gave up. And so obviously in the early days of seeking funding, you wanna retain as much of your ownership as possible. And so you wanna look for deal terms that allow you to grow, but don't necessarily you know, suck you dry. And so convertible notes, 
probably wanting to look at a rate somewhere between three to eight percent. You um, you probably want to put what we call a, a cap on. Well, the angel investors want the cap, although I, I do think that it work, works for you as well, which is just a terminology of once your valuation starts to take off, there's a certain number at which that angel investment group is going to be guaranteed to be able to buy in up to. Um, so you want to understand, you know, are the terms good for me um, and the angel investor? Because you want this to be a win-win situation. And then you also want to look at what we talked about earlier, which is what's the wisdom and other intangible kind of support that these angel investors are going to be bringing to me and my organization. And so with the new fund, we have a ton of, of expertise from ex-CEOs, people who've been in biotech, people who are in technology, lawyers, um, psychologists, um, and people who are really savvy on the financial side. And with that comes a lot of critique when we're doing due diligence and trying to understand about your company, but it also on the flip side brings a lot of connections and network that can help you as you're thinking about scaling up. Um, investment theses become really important. So what is this angel investor or angel investment group? What do they believe in? Who do they invest in? And who do they nurture as investees? Um, and we talked a little bit earlier about successful exits. So, you know, are, do they have a track record of picking companies that are winners? Which means if they pick me, maybe that's going to increase my odds of being able to be successful too. Any questions or any ads too? I've got one question. Yeah. Uh, what is the average level of sort of like hands-onness and what are some reasonable expectations of that you may be able to ask of an angel investor? So for instance, opening up their network to certain individuals or even conducting you know, certain tests. I don't know what would be the, uh, the what, what is sort of the average expectation? And what is the edge? Yeah. Um, I would say it depends on the investment that that angel investor is making. And, and again, I would think about this very selfishly too, as someone who is founder and CEO of a company. Do you want everyone who's investing five or $7,000 in your company to be involved in the inner workings of your business? Or do you want to reserve that? for people who are giving you, you know, $200,000, $500,000. And that's typically um, how we think about it too. So the bigger the investment, the more we're gonna wanna be involved. I would also say um, the riskiness of the investment is gonna dictate some of that as well. Um, and the, the newness of the industry. So at New Fund, we recently funded an organization that's quite frankly, a new vertical for, um, and, and a, a bit outside of the traditional investment theses that we make in life sciences and technology platform companies. Um, and we asked for a board observer role there, just so that we could make sure that we understood the inner workings, that we gained some confidence in the founder as well. So lead investors will typically ask for that board seat we weren't lead. Um, in this particular company, by the way, it was interesting. They had a really savvy CEO who was great at marketing and branding. And we ended up wanting to invest more than they would let us invest. And we asked to be a board observer just so that we could kind of um, give guidance and they allowed it. Looks like there's a couple other questions that pop up. Yeah, someone wants to know, um, does your group focus on a certain business segment or do you consider them all? Yeah, so we, we tend to focus very heavily on life sciences in, in New Fund. Um, but I would also say the other really big interest for us is, are in um, SaaS platform companies. And if you think about why, right? So life sciences are gonna have um, biotech companies, um, health, medical devices, 
um, they're going to have a pretty big market and, and more often than not, they're going to have a repeatable customer base. So we talked about that recurring revenue model. And that's exactly what happens when you have software as a service company as well, which is you start to get into having businesses that have the subscription model. So you have um, revenue that should be coming in on a pretty consistent basis, which allows you over time to spend less in the operation and infrastructure of your business. And it should allow you to expand your margins more successfully. I saw that there was a question about convertible note too. So a convertible note is um, basically a, a tool that you use to say, all right, I'm gonna give you money early on. And I talked about that, that discounting um, and, and it's gonna allow me to buy into your company. And at a later stage, once you get additional funding, I'm gonna convert that note into equity. And you're going to give me some favorable terms on that convertible note. And by the way, um, the convertible note is a little bit like a loan too. And um, there's going to be interest that you end up paying on that. And that's where I said that that's usually somewhere between three to 8% that you're going to want to be looking at. And they have maturity dates. So if you haven't, let's say, you know, you, you, you sign a convertible note today and it's due in March of 2024, and you haven't gone out for another round of funding, you're gonna to have to pay that, that interest that's owed on that note, just like you would a bank loan. Um, Hi, Maisha, I have a question. Yeah. So you have definitely demonstrated your wisdom and your business expertise and willingness to you know, engage with companies beyond the investment. Um, are you uh, comfortable with sharing successful exits that you've had? I haven't had any. <laughs> so, so we talk about the risk, right, of, of angel investing. There's been zero for me in that three years. Yet, you know, I keep, I keep investing because it's a long haul game. And I participate in our fund at New Fund because the diversification, kind of like playing the stock market, you, so, the more you but, diversify, the better. But I want to I want to couch that a little bit because what's what's interesting is that hi sorry hi Ray but, but Paula the the challenge here the question is good right. But the challenge is, is that you have to know who the people are in a VC. So here, here's the challenge. When you go to a real VC, by the way, New Fund is not a real VC, you know? We're an angel, yeah. Right, but, but not only that, but structurally, we're very different than most every startup, uh, whether it's a VC or what they call an angel group or whatever, they're basically the same, okay? They just go at different tiers. The point is when you ask them, what's your success rate? The problem is, is that in a lot of these cases, there are two or three principles that deal with everything and that's it. So yes, are they successful? Absolutely, why? Because they've done 100, 200 or 500 of these and yes, they have exits. You're going yep. to, you're bound to, that's luck. Okay, that's yep. just the way it works. With us, what's actually interesting and I wish more of the funds would do this is that we're very internal. So we rely on the people internal, like Maisha or myself or other people that you guys actually know, Bobby, um, that actually help out and do the due diligence, work with the uh, teams. Um, I've worked on teams for two months to get them you know, prepped because it just didn't work the way it was looking at. And so the challenge is, what I would say to you guys is know the guys that you're pitching to. Understand mm -hmm. how they work. All right. Just like if you were at a, um, you know, you're interviewing for a job, right? You'd look that company up and figure out who you're talking to and what their role is and everything. Does okay. that make sense, Paula? Yeah, it does. And it leads me to then ask on the investment thesis side, does new fund have a position about 
whether they invest in LLCs or public mm, benefit corp. Yeah, or well, that is such a great question. I'll let Maisha <laughs> answer that. <laughs> Thanks, Ray, for your wisdom. Um, so we do we we typically don't like to invest in LLCs. So the structure that we prefer is a corporation, preferably a corporation that has been incorporated in Delaware, just because most people understand the business laws and business structure of Delaware corporations. It becomes really difficult with LLCs because they're pastor entities, right? So, and if you have multiple members in an LLC, like who's really the owner? So we, we have a preference for um, corporations. Although I feel like, Ray, you've been here a little bit longer. Have we funded any LLCs? I'm sure we probably have. No, as a matter of fact, we're very stringent. You you yeah. cannot be an LLC. What about a public benefit corporation? Uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen that one. No, the, the challenge for us is we need to make money. So, um, you know, you need to be showing like a 15X. See, this is the thing. I, look, I don't want to rain on my issues. This is her thing, but... But just very quickly, we just have not, I've, I've only been a member of New Fund for about six years. And in that time, it just, no, we just do not do LLCs, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing is, we're really, really stringent about ownership. So remember how Maisha said about ownership, don't give too much away? Even at an early stage, we have turned down deals because we looked at it and we said, you know, the amount you're asking for you're going to own nothing. I mean, you're not going to own enough, meaning we're going to take pieces of it, right, based upon how much we put in on the cap table. And so we'll end up owning more than we're comfortable in owning. We don't want to own your business. We want to own a portion of your business and let you run it. And preferably own a portion at an early enough stage where that investment is going to be growing for us and it makes it worth it. So that's why we, we don't do LLC. We just do, you know, straight up. It's, it's very clear what our ownership share is. That's why. And so from a corporate perspective, it's this. Even on a note, we know exactly where we stand versus the valuation. And we don't get into that. I, 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 I which, went into which, the, which we, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me jump in here, Ray, because I think sure, no, that, that actually raises a really important point around cap table. So no one's really brought up this idea of a cap table. And that's really starting to get into the nuts and bolts of how many other investors are already here and how much have they invested. And that becomes important too, because if there's really big numbers and a lot of people with those big numbers, they're gonna really start to drive a lot of the direction of that organization too. And it's gonna start to dilute the value that we're gonna be able to get back out. So you gotta be really selective. Thank you both. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Ray. Other questions? Uh, I have a quick question for you. Um, uh, you had that really awesome graph where it showed the different stages yeah. and there was um, the venture capital and then to IPO right there. Mm -hmm. Now do, uh, just out of curiosity, with the venture capital group, would it be, could they, push a startup potentially to go IPO too quickly? Um, because you see these IPOs and they start off at, let's say $8 a share, and then they end up going down to like 50 cents a share. And, you know, is it, is it, they got the, they went too fast or they were pushed or, it, you know, I'm just curious why some of them, you know, don't succeed, don't succeed after they initially launched their IPO. That's a complicated question, right? I've been in I've been in a company that that did a SPAC, Angela, and it's not very successful. And a lot of it, so they and and the reason why they did a SPAC was probably very similar to why people would do an IPO. You need to raise more capital, and you want to get some of that from the open market, from some of the the, the buy side um, investors versus just having the venture capital. So maybe you've outgrown it. You need a lot more investment. Um, but the, the reasons why some of these companies fail really ranges, right? From horrible mismanagement by 
the leadership team to how they're kind of spending the money or wasting money to not having very solid business strategies to not meeting expectations of those investors and analysts who are saying you should be growing faster than the market or you should be growing with the market and you're not. And so now that you're in the open market, everyone is going to kind of be hedging bets about whether or not you're going to be surviving or not. So there's, I think there's a host of reasons why some companies don't um, succeed post IPO or SPAC. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about, oh, so we kind of we kind of went into this um, a little bit. So you think about what happens at New Fund. So Ray, Ray kind of talked about, it's really good to know someone, right? And so um, a lot of the, the deals that end up flowing through New Fund are actually, I think, brought in by a handful of people who are out there and really know a lot of the organizations. And so they bring, they make the introduction to the company. In the case of um, something that Ray and I have done in the past, we've actually started working with some organizations and I think Ray continues to do this much earlier on so that um, a, the organization, even if they're not ready to get funding, can um, be introduced to what it's like to pitch to an angel investment group and start to make um, connections to other folks within the organization. Um, in some cases though, I've also worked with organizations to kind of guide their CEO through, here's what the process is gonna look like, here are the kind of questions you're gonna be getting, just to make sure that they're prepped and ready when they come in. Because once you come in, um, you go through the screening, to make sure that we set up a back room, a deal room where you um, share your documents, a lot of financial statements. We go through a lot of that and we scrutinize it to understand things like, hey, why did you overinvest in marketing this particular month? Why is your profit and loss not adding up? What is your revenue looking like? Why is it down for this particular month and, and um, on a downward trend versus last year where it was on an upward trend. So those are all the kind of things that we end up doing as we're going through um, understanding and evaluating the company. After you pitch, it's kind of, you know, game time and a lot of questions thrown at you um, live. You usually have about um, 15 minutes or so to pitch in front of us. Um, and then we make a vote after you pitch about whether or not this is a deal that we wanna move further with um, or not. And then after we make a decision that yes, it's a company we wanna move forward with, we get into deeper due diligence, um, setting up calls with the, the, the organization leadership, um, getting really under the hood of your financials. So it could be meeting with your CFO, could be meeting with members of your marketing team. I know Bobby, um, is highly involved in um, the, the marketing parts of the, the, the organizations. He's always down to have those conversations. Um, and then we get into the terms, right? So how do we fund you? And um, what do all of those terms end up looking like? And then depending on where we are um, in terms of the deal, how early you are, we might make other introductions to um, organizations that we are that we are connected with, or who we feel like might be a, a good fit for you as well. Questions, thoughts. Okay. So let's talk about your. Let's talk about how you can you can prep because I know this is a lot to absorb and it can feel very very daunting. And so I'm thinking about when, when I put this slide together, I was thinking about what are the things that I typically hear after an organization has pitched or the questions that end up arising during the pitch that the, the founders are typically asked. And so, um, again, we talked about this being a game of IRR. We want, we want returns on that investment. And so... 
One of the most important ways that you get returns is if you have a first mover advantage, if you're offering something that the market really wants, but isn't being serviced today. So how is your product or service, which by the way, um, outside of SaaS, I'm not really sure that we fund services companies because they are typically too dependent upon an, a founder or owner to run it. Again, this is a game of, of scale, right? Can you go out and reach a lot of different people without one person having to be responsible? Because if something happens to that one person who is driving all the services, what's going to happen to the revenue for the organization? So thinking about competitive intelligence, right? Are you um, first mover? Are there other things that are similar that are out there? Are you truly bringing something that's new and captivating to the market? How quickly are you gonna be able to um, scale this up and reach more folks? And um, how, are you gonna, how are you gonna reach other customers, right? How are you gonna grow? And that's why when I talk about a lot of the folks that end up coming um, are very interested in that, that commercialization phase it's really about, we know we have something that's a winner. We now need the, the investment to help us get out there and start to move quicker before another competitor comes in and rains on our parade. The second area is around um, product market fit, which is something I'm sure all of you talk about in your rec innovation um, lab program. So some really good ideas just don't make it because the market simply isn't ready for it. So I remember one of, I think it was my marketing professor who was like, business is hard, business is hard, business is hard. And a lot of business is about timing and making sure that what you have, the market is ready for it. They recognize that they have a need and they recognize that what you are bringing is going to address that need. And, um, Obviously, and I'm not a lawyer, uh, Ray is, but I do know part of why we care so much about IP and patents and trade secrets is because you want to be able to protect and defend that innovation against copycats that are coming in. And so um, IP becomes very important and an important funding strategy too. So a lot of the folks that we see coming through do have patents, sometimes multiple patents. Um, and then the third thing is, how are you gonna spend that money, right? What does what you say you need to do to grow, is that matching with what you're saying you need and how you're gonna be spending the investment dollars that you're gonna be getting? And I've seen us be painfully, painfully scrutinizing organizations on these points and really saying, you know, it doesn't make sense what you're saying you need the money for. Um, you know, you're saying you wanna, you wanna scale your platform, but you're not looking to hire any salespeople. What's going on here? I have a couple other things that you're gonna be evaluated, but I wanna pause here and see if there's any questions. I've got a couple. You can always count on me to have at least a couple of questions. Uh, for innovation, um, I see uh, market readiness and need, but I guess how do you guys evaluate what is a useful innovation that is, you know, that, you know, whatever product it is, is a useful innovation? Mm -hmm. um, or how do you guys just uh, gauge innovation generally when you're assessing? Mm -hmm. So that's the part about when we, when I showed you that graph about when do you seek different types of funding, that's where you're going to, that's where you got to show some traction, right? And so um, I, I would say most of the organizations that I see coming through probably have revenue that's, that's either nearing or already in the million range. And so they've proven that the market wants what they have. And then we get under the hood and start asking questions about what's different from what competitor X, Y, and Z is offering. And um, especially in the, the, the sciences field, but I would say also probably in SAS, 
there's enough knowledge in this 300 member membership that we've pretty much seen every type of company that's out there. And so that's where we get under the hood. Who have you, who have you evaluated? What other competitors have you seen? What other kind of substitutes are already out there that are meeting this need and doing it better? So I think the best way, Tommy, to be prepared there is to make sure that you truly understand your marketplace and what you're offering and how it's differentiated. Got it, thanks. Yeah. All right, and then we got 10 minutes. So I just have a couple more slides. I just uh, have a quick question. This Yolanda, I apologize. Yeah. I'm in the middle of this right now with three companies um, on like this convertible note. And, and before I call my attorney and spend that money. I, I think just, you got to call your attorney, Yolanda. Yeah. I am not. Well, I just attorney. have a quick question. I just <laughs> got a quick question. It doesn't convert. So the term sheet on a convertible note is generally 24 months or 36 months. It doesn't convert to equity unless you don't pay that note at three to eight percent within that time frame. So it operates. I think you got to. I think you got to call your attorney on that one. It operates similar to debt, though, right? It does operate right. similar to debt. That's what I thought. Okay, I got it. I'm. I am going to call my attorney on the phone. Okay, good. Okay, good. <laughs> Don't want to get in trouble on that one. I'm sure Ray is cringing all over the place. Um, I so understand. then let's talk about a couple. Let's Don't talk about a couple. You're being recorded as well. <laughs> nice, right. Nice. Exactly. Answer. So I, yeah. So I'm referring you to your attorney on that. So let's talk about other ways that I've seen um, organizations be evaluated. I had a conversation with um, a senior executive at a pathology company today on this um, because they they have a bit of a dysfunctional leadership team and they're looking to get bought. And I said, you know, whether you know it or not, the way that you all interact together, the way that your leadership shows up, it's all being evaluated. So is, is a CEO someone who is open to listening and open to guidance in addition to being experienced, right? And, and, and that experience, by the way, um, is around, have you actually been a CEO and have you been a successful CEO with exits or not? How much industry expertise do you have? And does that expertise actually create a unique value that's gonna allow you to win in the marketplace versus someone else? The team, right? How do people get along? And it is interesting to me, I was in an offsite last week with the team and their energy and the way that they work together was so good. You could tell that there was chemistry. You could tell that everyone was engaged. And I've also see te seen teams where the opposite exist. And again, this is about balancing risk for the angel investor. And so we certainly don't want to fund an organization where that leadership team or the team overall isn't really in it for the long haul because you need people who are going to be feet on the ground getting this work done. The other piece that creeps in, and this is my other love topic, so I had to get it in somehow, is brand. I really preach a lot about, about brand and about culture because I believe that that becomes the essence of your competitive advantage. And so is your brand something that, um, that people can see and can, can kind of get behind? Does it resonate? I've actually seen a couple of members of New Fun actually going to look at Twitter and Instagram to see how many followers an organization has to see if there truly is, if they do have a, a big following, mainly in the CPG um, or consumer goods space. But you know, if you're a brand that's gaining traction, you should be having people who are following with you and everything that you do should be bringing that brand to life. And then ESG is becoming really important, right? And so even if it's not a company that's about, that's a public benefit or a B Corp, um, this idea of, of giving back and sustainability is becoming a really important issue and could be something that is important from an investment thesis for some of these angel investors as well. So remember how you show up really, really matters. Um, and I think that's really, I think that's it. So. Um, I'm going to stop 
presenting and see if I can see you all and see if there's other questions. Are you Longer. sure? Yeah, Crystal, yeah. Oh yeah, I was gonna see, are you able to see what that um, the results were from the- Oh, poem? right, thank you for that. Hold on, let me go in. That really kind of thumbs me out. Um, I don't know why. Share screen. I did that. Huh. Okay. I may have to go. Oh, responses. There you go. It was my fault. It was user error. All right. Let me share my screen. Thank you, Crystal, for reminding me to do no that. No problem. Load up. And why is it still not showing? Hold on. Let me go back to this. It was up. responses. There we go. So most, can you all see my screen? Yep. All right. So most of you, those of you who figured out how to get in, it looks like a lot of us didn't figure out how to do it. The next time I present, I'll make sure I give instructions before we start and put it in the chat. But most were saying at the early product concept stage um, or at the growth stage. And so the right answer was um, right around C and D is where you want to do it. Um, and so a little early at that early product, at that early product concept, because you're still trying to figure it out and probably, um, probably a little too late at the growth stage, because you want to make sure that you're using that money to help you accelerate how you're going to market. So awesome. Thank you, Crystal, for having me go back to that. Yeah, no problem. If there's like one thing that you could leave us all with before we go today, what, what do you think that would be? Mm, I think the most important part when you're thinking about angel investing is making sure that you are seeking the right fit from the, the angel investor. It's a real, it's a relationship. And so don't just think about it as money and um, kind of jump at the first offer that's coming your way evaluate angel investors as much as they are evaluating you. Be smart and hold on to your equity. May I ask one question before you run? Yeah. Sure. Uh, so the question is, what is something from your experience that um, startup founders do that they think that uh, angel investors would value, but angel investors don't actually value as much? And then what is something that you don't think enough uh, startup founders um, do or demonstrate um, that angel value uh, angel investors really do value and wish that startup founders would um, do or demonstrate more? I think that's a really hard question. <laughs> but but one of the things that popped in my head is, and I, I think this is probably a lesson for um, for life too. I feel like people when they when they pitch, believe that they have to have an answer to every question. And even if they don't know the answer, they, they may fudge it and pretend like they, they do. And I would say that probably does more damage than not. I think there's far more credibility in just saying, I don't know, I'm gonna have to look into that and I'll get back to you. Cause I think that preserves integrity and makes you look like you're not just kind of pandering. Um, an answer to get to get dollars. So that's what I would say. Oh, that uh, actually answered the second question I had too, but I, I didn't have time for the second one, but you actually ended up answering it anyway, but thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Maisha. Amazing workshop and great. Thank you so much for answering all these questions. It was really awesome. Really appreciate all that you do for the rec. And there's some comments in the chat, just, you know, just thank you so much for letting it for being here with us tonight <laughs> yeah thank you we'll have to change your logo for tech coast angels in the back and put in and we'll have to get you a new right. fun a new oh, yeah. fun ventures one absolutely <laughs> i'll do that tonight <laughs> thank yeah you. that's awesome so please you know thanks ray always good to see you so please if you all have questions allison good to see you thanks for joining um if you all have questions please reach out to me um i'll put my email in chat i'm happy to um, be of assistance or find me on LinkedIn and 
I wish you all lots of luck and look forward to seeing many of you in rec office hours. Or Thursday. Or Thursday for the pit. That's when the pitch is. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. The new pitch competition. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Okay. Oh, well, good. Hopefully some of these things will help you all as you're preparing too. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so all right. much.